Welcome to Alpha Coding Podcast, an all-access pass to medical coding and billing pro tips that help you start your week off smarter. And now, here is your host, Tony L. Holmes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alpha Coding Podcast series. I'm your host, Tony L. Holmes. Welcome to episode 66 of the podcast. Today is April 5th. Welcome to a brand new month. And this past week was a lot of fun. I collaborated with my good friend over at Healthcare Fraud Shield podcast, Karen Weintraub. We talked about some fun things on her show. So definitely go check out the Healthcare Fraud Shield podcast. So today we're going to cover a topic that I get a ton of questions about. So we're going to talk about mastering physical therapy or PT coding. So before we dive into our topic, it's time for your Monday dose of positivity, the Mindset Monday tip. And it's brought to you by Project Resume. When is the last time you had your resume updated? Your resume is literally your entry ticket to that next great opportunity. Project Resume will design a customized ATS-friendly resume to demonstrate your unique skills and experience. And even better, it's written by coders for coders. Make that investment in yourself today and visit projectresume.net and mention my code alpha coding for special pricing. So our Mindset Monday tip is all about managing self-doubt. I talk about self-doubt all the time, but the quote I want to share with you says, doubting yourself is normal. Letting it stop you is a choice. And I think it's an important reminder that choosing to stay where you are because you doubt your abilities to succeed is an active decision, even though you may be doing it subconsciously. And the thing that I've learned most about self-doubt is that when I'm onto something really big, like I'm on the verge of a major breakthrough or a major success, that is when I experience the worst self-doubt. I start to question whether or not I'm capable of executing at the level that needs to be executed. And so that's how I know that I'm onto something big because that self-doubt creeps in and that voice gets louder and louder. And over time, with a lot of practice, with a lot of intention and a lot of great techniques, you're better able to manage and work through that self-doubt. So just keep in mind, self-doubt is the most common reason behind failure And you have to make a conscious effort, a conscious decision to not let it hold you back. So today we're going to cover my top 10 pro tips for mastering PT coding. I get a ton of questions from the listeners submitting these for the coding pro tips. And I thought this was worth dedicating an entire episode to. So I do a ton of physical therapy audits and I have seen some unbelievable stuff. I would say up until the year 2017, the PT documentation requirements were pretty minimal. From 2017 forward, we saw a big shift in the documentation requirements. And unfortunately, there were a lot of practices, a lot of organizations that did not make changes and invest in training and education. And now they're suffering the consequences because they're getting all of these post-payment audits and they don't have the documentation to support the services that they've already been paid for. And just to give you a bit of context, some of these recoupment amounts are extrapolated So they could be in the hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars worth of services. So we're not dealing with pennies and cents here. And a lot of people have this misconception that because PT is a low dollar specialty, there aren't any audit risks. And that's just simply not the case. So this brings me to my pro tip number one. Everything starts with the PT evaluation. So back in 2017, there were significant changes to physical therapy eval codes, and a lot of the PTs did not get the training and education that they needed. So CPT codes 97161 through 97164 are going to be your PT eval codes. The first three codes are going to be for your new evals, and they're based on complexity, so low, moderate, or high complexity. And then there's only one re-evaluation code. So each of these codes have their own specific documentation requirements, specifically with assessment and treatment plan documentation, patient goals, etc. And then you'll also notice that these codes are based on either time, which it has a typical time threshold associated with each code, or complexity-based. So it's whichever is most appropriate based on the documentation. 
The biggest issue I see with PT evals is frequency. So reporting multiple new evaluation codes for the same injury. And then I also see big gaps in the treatment plan documentation. So everything starts with that PT eval. And then from that point, you start to see the therapeutic and manual exercises and activities. Pro tip number two, know the difference between time-based PT codes and service-based PT codes. So in PT, there are two categories of codes. There are service-based codes, which is you render the service and you report that code and then the time-based codes. So those are based solely on time. And if you don't have proper time documentation to support those codes, then they're not billable. So for the service-based codes, these are things like the evaluations, hot cold packs, electrical stimulation that's unattended, anything that is service-based, you can only report one of those codes per encounter, no matter how long you spend actually providing that treatment. And same thing goes with a hot or cold pack. You can't bill for 20 hot or cold packs. You get to report that service regardless of how much you're actually providing. And then for the time-based PT services, these require constant attendance. So you can't just go and see other patients or do other things. So for the time-based services, these all require a minimum amount of time. And you'll see in the CPT descriptions, 15 minutes is required. Now there are exceptions to this rule and I'll get into those specifics later on in the show, but you'll notice that these all require a time element. So these are going to be things like manual therapy, neuromuscular re-education, gait training, therapeutic exercises, therapeutic activities. All of these codes have a minimum time threshold that has to be met in order to report the service. One of the number one deficiencies I see when I'm doing PT audits is lack of time documentation for the time-based service codes. Pro tip number three, understand the eight-minute rule. So the eight-minute rule is a really important rule for coding PT services. So CMS and AMA have their own version of the rule of eights, but in a nutshell, in order to report a time-based service with that 15-minute requirement, the provider would need to document a minimum of eight minutes of service time in order to report that code. So these time-based codes don't technically have to meet the full 15 minutes as long as that eight minutes is documented. But where it can get really tricky is when you have, let's say, four minutes for manual therapy, and then you have eight minutes for therapeutic activities, and then you may have, let's say, 18 minutes of gait training. That's where it can get really tricky in terms of figuring out where you can add those mixed remainders. Pro tip number four, pay close attention to units for each CPT code. So one of the things that I see most commonly in audits is issues with units reported. So let's say, for example, you have 35 minutes of manual service activity and you have 15 minutes of therapeutic activity and you wanted to report three units of the manual and one unit of the therapeutic. Well, technically, you haven't met that minimum time threshold, which would be 38 minutes to report three units of that manual therapy. And because there's no overage on the therapeutic activity, because only 15 minutes was documented, there's no way to report the additional minutes under the manual therapy service time because there's no overage. So PT is one of the areas that you got to get ready to do some serious math. And these mixed remainders can be really confusing. And that's where I see a ton of issues when I'm doing audits. So if you're new to PT, you definitely want to have yourself a cheat sheet handy that has the number of minutes that are associated with each number of units. So for example, 8 to 22 minutes is going to be one unit, 22 to 37 minutes is going to be two units, and then just keep going up from there. This is going to be really helpful to you as you're coding and auditing for PT. Pro tip number five, direct patient contact is required for one-on-one services. So this is actually something that I've seen with my own eyes performing assessments in PT and sports medicine clinics. So the clinics are set up in a big group exercise area, and I've seen providers that are actually doing group therapy that they're reporting as direct one-on-one patient contact services. This is a huge compliance risk because the direct patient contact codes require one-on-one care. 
So the provider can't do this in a group setting and then report each of these codes as if they were performed on a one-on-one basis because there are specific group therapy codes. This is something that is insidious and not always easily detectable unless you've actually been boots on the ground in a PT clinic and see how these things operate. So these direct patient contact codes require one-on-one service time. Pro tip number six, be mindful of PT supervision requirements. So every insurance is different in terms of their requirements. The majority of payers follow Medicare guidelines. In my time working with PT, I've seen some pretty crazy stuff in terms of violations with supervision requirements, having PT students, having PT assistants doing work that is outside of their scope of practice and then reporting it under the physical therapist. So policies can vary depending on the insurance and then each state has their own state practice act provisions. And then of course, the setting that the PT is being rendered is going to determine the amount of supervision required. So there's three levels, general, direct, and personal. So for example, if you have an outpatient PT clinic, there are certain instances where a PTA can provide services to support the PT and report those services under the PT so long as those supervision requirements are met. So some of the stipulations are that the services that the PTA provide are medically necessary. The supervising PT is immediately available to intervene and is on site providing direct supervision. And the PT has active ongoing involvement with the management and care of that patient's condition. And at the end of the day, it's the PT's responsibility to evaluate and assess, develop a plan of care, and oversee that those services are being provided to patients at the highest level. Pro tip number seven, leverage technology with built-in PT billing calculations. So I've seen a lot of, especially in orthopedic practices that have PT clinics, I've seen them try to take their EHR and then force the PTs to use it. And those systems do not have the proper functionality to calculate for PT units. So PT clinics should really be using PT specific software that has that built in eight minute rule functionality to where they don't have to worry about calculating the math and it's automated. So WebPT is one of my favorite PT softwares. It's really sleek and it has that automated eight minute rule calculator so that there's no real math involved. And for the most part, when I perform audits on practices that have this specific software, I don't see compliance issues with regards to the units that are being reported for the services. Whereas in other organizations where they don't have that built-in calculator, that's where I tend to see a lot of errors. Pro tip number eight. Take note of the telept rule changes and expansion during the public health emergency. So with all of the PHE expansion for COVID-19, a lot of services for physical therapy were approved to be rendered via telehealth. So what this means is that during the PHE, a lot of PTs have been allowed to provide certain designated services via synchronous audio video technology. So it's hard to say whether or not this is going to be a permanent thing. I definitely think that there are a lot of benefits for certain patients. I actually work with one of the largest telept companies in the country, and this company has been doing telept long before the COVID-19 pandemic, and their outcomes have shown that this can be incredibly convenient for patients and actually lead to better outcomes with recovery because patients are more involved in that active PT care. Whereas if you have to go to an office, let's say three to four times a week for PT, that's going to be a much bigger deterrent than if you just open up your iPad and are able to do those same exercises with your PT via telehealth. But unfortunately, I've also seen a lot of fraud that's happening with telept. So I've seen some cases where patients are being sent what's the equivalent of a YouTube channel with all of these pre-recorded exercise videos, and they're trying to use those exercise videos as a billable opportunity to insurance companies. This is obviously a case of non-compliance, but you'd be surprised some of the fraud cases that we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. Pro tip number nine, verify payer policies on PT. So I talked about how the rule of eights is different for the AMA versus CMS. And there can also be a lot of variations for workers' compensation, automobile, 
in terms of what's accepted and what's not for PT services. So it's really important that you verify all of your payer policies. And then, of course, the scope of practice rights in your state if you have PTAs and PT students working in your clinic. And of course, there's always going to be exceptions to everything. But for the most part, payers follow Medicare standards for PT coding and reporting. Pro tip number 10, routine audits and education are a non-negotiable So I talked about this in the beginning, but I think that a lot of PT clinics got left behind in 2017 when there were all of these changes to the documentation requirements for PT services. And so I see a lot of reactive behavior when these PT clinics get recruitment requests or post-payment audit requests because they haven't made an investment in ongoing audits and education. Anytime you're reporting services to an insurance company, you have to have robust audit protocols and education efforts in place as part of the organization's compliance program. And I think there's a false sense of security that if you are a small clinic or a small practice, that because you are small, you don't have to invest in those compliance programs, but that's definitely not the case. If you're reporting services to insurance, you're at risk of an audit, very similar to when you file your taxes. You're at risk of an audit and you want to make sure that your risk is as low as possible by investing in those ongoing audits and education. So grab a pen and paper to summarize my top 10 pro tips for mastering physical therapy coding. Number one, everything starts with the PT eval. Number two, Know the difference between time-based PT codes and service-based PT codes. Number three, understand the eight-minute rule. Number four, pay close attention to units for each CPT code. Number five, direct patient contact is required for one-on-one services. Number six, be mindful of PT supervision requirements. Number seven, leverage technology with built-in PT billing calculations. Number eight, take note of the telept rule changes and expansions during the public health emergency. Number nine, verify payer policies on PT. Number 10, routine audits and education are a non-negotiable. So it's time for this week's coding pro tip, and it's brought to you by Contempo Coding, which is an on-demand educational resource provider created for coders by coders. They specialize in affordable coding certification prep courses to help you accelerate in your career. Right now, they're offering an exclusive special to Alpha Coding Podcast listeners, and that's $125 off the Certified Risk Adjustment Coding Prep course, as well as some great bonus content when you order through our affiliate website. This course has a 100% pass rate, by the way. Visit our website, alphacodingexperts.com, and head over to the Deals and Discounts tab for a link to take advantage of this absolute steal of a deal. If you have a coding-related question and would like it to be featured in one of our coding pro tips, please reach out to me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. So this week's coding pro tip comes to us from California. Hi, Tony. I loved your episode on effectively managing down. I work in a highly toxic environment and your show inspired me to make a career change. My question to you is regarding coding productivity measures. As I'm applying for new jobs, what are some key productivity measures that I should highlight? What does a good manager look for? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for your kind words and support of the podcast. I'm really glad to hear that you decided it was time for a change. Life is way too short to be miserable. So as far as coding productivity measures, I think it's really important to highlight your accuracy rate. So most people are going to look for 95% or higher. They're also going to look at how many charts you're coding per hour or how many charts you're auditing per hour and the types of specialties that you've been coding for. So there are specialty specific benchmarks that managers are aware of, and they look for those specific benchmarks to be met. I also think it's really important to highlight your soft skills, that you're a team player, that you're somebody that catches on to things quickly. And of course, a high attention to detail is going to be really important for any coding role. So never underestimate the value of highlighting your soft skills. But of course, highlighting some of those key productivity measures will definitely help you stand out. So I wish you the best of luck on your job search and definitely keep me posted on your progress. Please remember to hit that subscribe button now so you never miss another episode. 
Also, be sure to drop us a five-star rating and review on iTunes. We really appreciate your support. So this concludes today's episode. Until next week, thank you for listening to the Alpha Coding Podcast. We'll see you next Monday. For more information about medical coding and billing pro tips, including how to hire alpha coding experts, follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or visit our website at www.alphacodingexperts.com.